Hello there ladies and gentlemen, this is Orphan Last, aka Skylar Madison, and today I'm going to walk you through the process of working in one point perspective while I compose an image. So far, working in perspective has been a bit sterile. While you're drawing a bunch of boxes, you start modifying them and all of that sort of thing. And in most cases, you'll be doing that when working in perspective. But in this case, for this image, I felt as though I could draw things a little bit differently, a little bit more organically. I could visualize it really easily because I had a reference. Now, just like I just barely said, I decided to use a reference for this image. And just a word of warning, since it's one point perspective, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an easier picture to draw. Regardless of how many vanishing points you have on the screen, you are still drawing in perspective. It's the exact same process. You still have to use your brain, and I feel the reference might help you for visualization's sake as well. That's another reason why I decided to use reference for this image. But really quick here, I've thought about continuing this series, teaching how to draw in perspective, in Affinity Photo, but it just feels like downgrading when it comes to drawing in perspective, like going back to using Affinity Photo, so I actually will be continuing to teach perspective in Clip Studio Paint Pro from here on out. But rest assured, perspective is perspective. It doesn't matter if you're drawing with pencil and paper, with Photoshop, Illustrator, Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, or any other of the slew of software and material that happens to be out there. It doesn't matter. Perspective is perspective. The rules are the same regardless of what software and materials you happen to be using. Meaning, regardless of what you're using to draw your picture, you should be able to follow through the process necessary to draw this image with me at least if you so choose. Or you can just watch this video and try to digest how an artist thinks while drawing a picture in perspective. Rest assured, I do plan on doing things in this video the same way as I have been doing in previous perspective videos. Uh, that way you guys have the same visual cues on the screen as seen in previous videos. I don't pretend to be the artist high on a mountaintop saying every artist draws in perspective exactly the way I do. All I'm really saying is that this is how I draw. This is how I measure proportions. And that's all that matters to me and generally people tend to think that that looks pretty professional, and I do pick up commissions from time to time, so take it for what it's worth. First thing that I do is I move my reference image of the car down on the stacking order on the layers panel, and I rename layer 1 to sketch, okay? It's now the sketch layer. Since I want to be drawing in perspective, I need to create a unique type of layer, and it needs rulers attached to it, and at least inside of Clip Studio Paint, this is how it works. So I go up to the layer menu up at the top, and I go to Ruler or Frame, and then I go ahead and select Create Perspective Ruler. As you can see, a pop-up menu appears, and I have access to 1-point perspective, 2-point perspective, and 3-point perspective. I really hope that eventually developers for Clip Studio Paint introduce curvilinear perspective to the list, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see if that ever happens. But for this video, all that we need is one point perspective, so I select one point perspective and click OK. If you look over at the tools panel to the left, the software has automatically switched to the operation tool. And as you can see in the sub tool operation menu, I have an object selected. This is great. This is how we interact with the perspective grid or the perspective guides. Now, as you can see, we have this little purple plus right here. That right there is the vanishing point. And as you can see, it's attached to a blue horizontal line going across here. That is the horizon line. So if I click on this purple plus, which we know is the vanishing point, with the operation tool, and click and drag on it, you can see that I'm moving both, the vanishing point and the horizon line, both together. And I can move them anywhere I want. But really quick here, we can now see in the layers panel that there's a new layer titled Perspective Ruler 1. This layer has our perspective grid on it. I'm just going to move this layer right underneath the sketch layer on the stacking order in the layers panel, and rename it measurements. Let's keep the horizon line rather high on the composition, but if you are able to follow along with this video as it is successfully, later on you can go about watching this video again and try out this tutorial and try to see if you can follow this video with the horizon line lower on the canvas. 
this. That right there would be a bit of a mind-blowing experience for you. In fact, it'd be a really educational experience for you to try out. But I wouldn't suggest doing that if you're struggling with perspective already and trying to follow along with my perspective videos. If you're struggling, just do what I'm doing. If you're doing really good, go ahead and experiment with that concept. Okay, so these purple lines that radiate from the vanishing point, these represent your foreshortened parallel lines that radiate from the vanishing point. Basically, if you've drawn out a thumbnail and you have some super rough perspective drawn out in it, you can use these things to make sure that the placement of your vanishing point is where you might want it to be. Or I could go ahead and maximize the size of my reference image and get the vanishing point perfectly on my canvas where it should be in relationship to my reference image. Personally, I like to do things organically, so I'm just throwing out a guess as to where it should go. So my camera angle inside of my picture is going to be a little bit different than the camera angle uh, as represented inside of the reference image. Now, a word of caution. If you find that your lines aren't getting locked to your perspective grid, click on your vanishing point and make sure that over here where there's this big four arrowed circle, right underneath it and to the right, make sure that it has an X rather than a no smoking sort of symbol. Uh, if the no smoking symbol is there in that tiny little icon, it means that your perspective ruler or guide has been deactivated. Maybe because you have other guides that you've created or something like that and a different guide is active at that moment in time. This is how you activate and deactivate it basically with the operation tool uh, working with the perspective guide. There is one other instance where this might happen where your brush might be drawing kind of freehand instead of locking to your perspective guides and I'll talk about that in just a second but we'll, we'll continue moving on just real quick here. Now to the right of your vanishing point you'll notice that there's these little dots right here and right here just to the right of the vanishing point and on either side of this vertical purple line that represents straight up and straight down. If you click and drag on either one of these little dots to the right of the vanishing point, you'll notice that the horizon line and this other vertical line uh, start to rotate into a Dutch angle. And here I go ahead and just demonstrate really quick. I draw out a quick box at a Dutch angle just to show what I mean. Okay, so now I'm just going to press Ctrl Z a few times to get things back to being properly horizontal and vertical. Now this next step is just for those of you that have been following my other tutorials on perspective and to give you guys uh, the same sort of visual that is on the screen with my previous videos. I create a new layer and I call it perspective and I'm using yellow in order to represent vertical lines. And so I just manually draw this out and then I use green to represent my horizontal lines and once again I manually draw each line out at least inside of Clip Studio Paint I do and then I use a light blue color Color in order to draw out the lines that are radiating out from the vanishing point. And again, I manually draw each and every one of these just by hand manually. You don't necessarily have to do this little step here. It might help you visually. Uh, if it helps you, feel free to do it especially if your software doesn't have any sort of perspective guides or anything like that, or if you don't want to use any perspective guides, uh, doing this step might help you, especially if you're struggling to understand what it is that I do inside of my videos dealing with perspective. Now, throughout this video, I don't really use the vertical and horizontal lines all that much for this particular image. I didn't feel like I really needed them, but you'll see what I mean by that. I do use them, but not a whole lot. I'm, the main thing that I'm using is the vanishing point. Okay, so first things first, with my measurements layer selected, I use a darker but saturated color in order to draw the first step out. I use other colors throughout this video, but still I tend to draw my measurements with a bunch of different colors for visual cues to help me understand what's going on in the scene. Okay, so now earlier I mentioned that sometimes your brush isn't locked to your vanishing point and that I'd mention another way that this might happen. Up here, you'll notice that there's this highlighted icon right here in the middle here. Yeah, this activates and deactivates the snapping operation to your brush or to any other type of special ruler inside of Clip Studio Paint. So what this means is that when this icon is not highlighted, you're able to freehand 
just like this. And so throughout this whole process, I'm activating and deactivating that button up there constantly. Another way to activate and deactivate is by pressing Control 2. That might help you. I, I, I find that it's kind of a 50-50% Control 2 and activating and deactivating it on the actual graphic user interface. So I need to make sure that these chairs are the same size, okay? That's, that's really important. And I also need to make sure that the proportions are correct. So this center console where your gear shift thingamajig is, I forgot what it's called, I need to make sure that it's not too big or too small, okay? If you're not measuring things out, chances are you're going to get it wrong. So I go ahead and draw out the bottom face of the chair closest to us, using the vanishing point on the left and right, you know, drawing lines on the left and right using the vanishing point, and using the horizon line in order to create the furthest portion of it, the furthest edge of this chair. Okay, so just visualize this little rectangle on the screen right here as the chair that's closest to us that you've seen inside of my reference image, okay? Just do that. Just that is the chair closest to us. So. Okay, so inside of Clip Studio Paint, I'm able to use this rectangle and find center in a very specific way. So I tap my stylus on one of the corners of this rectangle, press and hold shift, and bring my stylus over to the opposing corner of the rectangle and click, or tap my stylus right there. And that gives me a straight, perfect line. I use this operation quite frequently inside of Clip Studio Paint. It's really helpful, it's really nice. Just be aware that it will always draw a line that's at the maximum thickness of your brush size that you have your brush set to. So I created an X here and that gives me the center of the rectangle. This is a measurement if, for those of you that haven't been following my tutorials dealing with how to draw in perspective. So I extend the center and both of the edges of this rectangle out towards the vanishing point. So now I draw out an extension. Now I've taught how to draw extensions in previous videos. Here's a link in the upper right corner of the screen where I draw out some bridges and I teach how to draw out extensions and what they do. If you haven't seen that video, then this video will be harder for you to follow. Okay, so now let's go ahead and split that extension by one half. So I do another extension with the one quarter section that I now just created, okay? So that means that this right here is the same measurement as right here, okay? It's kind of hard to follow, but you know, you, you just have to be thinking about how the geometry is working. So now I use an extension using both quarters in order to make a full measurement. And I now have a full chair in the distance. Now, you may notice if you've been following along, the chair furthest from us is bigger, it's, it's a bigger measurement than the chair closest to us. That's because in the reference image, the chair that's closest to us is part partially off the canvas, and I decided that about a quarter of it is off the canvas. That's just what I decided, and that's how the measurements are working out. So now I switch colors to purple, and I just try to flesh out the center console by drawing out a front face to what will be a rectangular box, okay? Just think of it that way. And then I freehand this little curvature, because I can actually see that curvature going on there inside of the reference. Now I could draw out out the bottom portion here where the resting area of the feet are but we're really not going to be seeing much of any of that so we don't really need to worry too much about that especially since we can have a reference right here telling us what to do kind of okay okay so we decided that this section right through here is the center console so this face that I'm highlighting is the bottom face to the center console okay just be aware of that it's a face that won't really even exist in the final image but having it here is a measurement that's going to help us. It's a guide that's going to help us. So now I flesh out the left face and then I finish off the right side of it as much as I feel is necessary. And right where the chair ends to the right, I go ahead and wrap a line around the purple rectangle. And that signifies where the stick shift is going to be about. So now I change colors to a slightly lighter green than what I was using just a little short while earlier. So I kind of guess where the front of the storage compartment goes for the center console. And I draw out a rectangle going up on those four corners that go straight up. Just draw those up. And I just arbitrarily decide on the height for it. The reference image is kind of telling me just 
how tall it should kind of be, so I kind of have a feel for where it should go. I don't really feel like I need to do a measurement, so that's why I do it the way I do. It may look confusing right now, but in time, I'm going to pull out my sketch layer and flesh this out so that you can understand what's happening a, a bit better. It may take a few repeat viewings for you to understand what's happening here, okay? And that's fine. At this point, I lower the opacity on the measurements layer just a touch, not too much, and on the top of this lighter green rectangle, I draw out a red rectangular box and extend it just a little bit further on the right face, just moving it a little bit so that it has an overhang in relationship to the lighter green box, okay? All right, so now it's time to use the sketch layer using a pure black color. And so in my reference, I can see that this storage area to the center console comes out at a bit of an angle. And so I go ahead and copy that a little bit Bit. And I can see that the lid to the storage area is kind of rounded, and it's rounded on the top as well. Sometimes I'm using the perspective grid, and sometimes I'm not. Uh, a lot of this image is freehanded, even still. So I'm frequently snapping and unsnapping my brush to this perspective grid. Now, I've already told you how to do that. You can press Control 2, or you can press that button up there. Okay. As I draw, it's common for me to make mistakes and fix them. So in the process of fleshing out this storage area to the center console, I have several occasions where I make adjustments. On my reference, I can see that there's this little lip right here, right next to the storage area. So let's go ahead and copy that. You can see me adjust the storage area a bit to accommodate that little lip. I actually have two attempts at adjusting it to accommodate that lip, just getting it just right. I lower the opacity a bit more to the measurements layer and then I go to my sketch layer again and draw out that lip on both sides of the center console both closest to us and furthest from us on the center console itself okay with the measurements layer I go ahead and change my color to something bright and fully saturated and I go ahead and draw out a shape that I see as the back support of the chair closest to us now this right here is a little bit of a mistake but I I'm going to go ahead and continue describing things so now I kind of darken the green color and kind of up the opacity to the measurements layer really quick. I, I do this a lot inside of this video. And I go to the left and right corners of the back resting area of the chair and extend them towards the vanishing point all the way to the vanishing point. Most of the time when I extend a line all the way to the vanishing point, I'm trying to tell myself that there's some repeating proportions that are happening and that they will need to be attended to. For example, the other chair that's going to be the same height as the chair in the foreground. These lines are telling me how tall that chair is going to be off in the distance. It has to be uniform with what's in the foreground. Otherwise, it's just going to look wonky. So basically, these two lines that are extending out all the way towards the vanishing point, I'm just making sure that both chairs share that same line. Okay, so at this point, I realize that I don't like something about what I've drawn here. So I press Control Z a few times and up the opacity even more on the measurements layer really quick. I'm seeing what's on my reference versus what I initially drew out there. And I need to make sh just a really quick adjustment. So I draw out a green line to the vanishing point right here. And that new line is going to be the back of the seating area of the bottom of the chair. Okay, it's just a slight adjustment. Okay, so now I can draw out that diagonal face, that weird skewed looking face, and it seems like it's getting thicker towards the bottom. And notice that my lines are a little sketchy, that's fine, I cleaned them up a little bit. I'm just kind of working the shape of the object a little bit. And just like I did with the first attempt, I trail off the top corners all the way towards the vanishing point. So now I go ahead and freehand the furthest portion of the chair here and wrap it around those two lines going off towards the vanishing point. And now I draw an X in the middle of this new right face here. And I freehand a diagonal line to signify this is the right face's center. And I use an obnoxious yellow in order to find my one-fourth measurement lines on either side of the center. And I freehand my diagonal one-fourth, one-quarter lines basically right there. Now, I pull out a purple and kind of flesh out the shape of the chair 
quite a bit here. These yellow one-fourth measurement lines are telling me how the chair tapers in towards the top and towards the center there. So once again, I'm, I'm basically just fleshing out this chair with the purple lines. But at this point, I, I notice a mistake uh, where I didn't use that one-fourth measurement line that's closest to the camera or closest to us. The chair isn't tapering in towards the, the top center and meeting in with that yellow one quarter, one fourth line right there. Specifically the, the one fourth or one quarter measurement line that's closest to us. So I press Control Z a bunch of times, so the chair needed to taper in at the yellow one fourth line, and that's that's closest to us like like this. This is how it needs to look. Problem solved. Okay, so now I use a bright green color and freehand some diagonal lines that merge in to the right dark green line going towards the vanishing point, and then wrap the bright saturated green lines around to the left dark green lines extending all the way to the vanishing points. So as you can see, I just created a new face that exists that exists within this region right here. And now I just need to make the exact same sorts of measurements that I made on the side closest to us, on the chair closest to us specifically. So now I use purple in order to flesh this out and get the chair to taper in towards these one-fourth marks and flesh out the top face a little bit. So there's this little ribbed area with regards to the back support of the chair. So I draw out an upside down U shape in order to kind of build the basic building block of where all of those ribs are going to be. And I notice that there's a seam in the cloth and kind of flesh that out as well. Now I lower the opacity of my measurements layer and go back to my sketch layer and with black I go ahead and clean up my sketch quite significantly. And I'm looking at my reference here and there in order to see what it looks like in contrast to what I'm drawing. At this point, about 95% of what I'm drawing is freehand. And most of the time, the only thing that I'm using for my perspective grid is the vanishing point. And now I go back to my measurements layer and I use a dark blue color and extend a line right where the top of the seams are on the chair closest to us and another blue line at the top of where the ribbed section of the chair is. This is to make sure that the proportions match with the seams and the ribbed area on both chairs. And at that point I go ahead and flesh out the chair off in the distance. Now as I'm drawing this out, I'm trying to make it fairly accurate, but I'm also keeping in mind that this is still just a sketch, and I'm going to be inking it digitally as well. The measurements layer starts out looking basic, the sketch layer itself gets more advanced in terms of being more refined, and the inking process kind of just perfects it. So although you want it to look right with the sketch layer, you don't have to aim for perfection with the sketch layer. I deactivate my sketch layer just for a moment and use a dark blue on my measurements layer to draw out an X through the front face of the back support of the chair furthest from us and draw out a front face. And I was actually thinking that I'd be able to use this to help flesh out where the steering wheel to the car would go, but I didn't wind up actually using that. I just wound up doing this I just kind of wish that I had figured something out in order to make sure the placement of the steering wheel was just right, but the end result still wound up looking okay. It actually looked real good, uh, so I'm not too disappointed in myself. I have an idea as to how I could have done it better with that, but we live and we learn. Anyhow, so I activate my sketch layer again, and I use a light blue in order to draw out a square that follows the ribbed section that I drew out earlier. And I draw out an X to find center and extend the measurement out towards the vanishing point using a bright saturated red. And I continue splitting this up using X's and such like that a whole bunch I just do that a whole bunch and extend out out the centers towards the vanishing point a whole bunch as well And making sure that each line that's extending out towards the vanishing point skewers the chair out in the distance I then use the sketch layer change the color to black and I use the red lines I just measured out in order to draw out the ribs on both chairs and now it's time to draw out the bottom portion of the seat Again, I freehand most of this. Anytime I need to use the vanishing point, I just activate snapping with my 
brush. That's it. But generally, I'm looking up at my reference and trying to match what I'm drawing with what's in my reference. So earlier, because of what's in our reference, we decided that the chair in the foreground would be off the canvas a bit. But we need to make the same sorts of measurements that we made with the red lines earlier. That's fine, we don't necessarily have to use all of that space. I use my perspective grid and I draw out a red line and I use this space right here that I'm filling in right now and I use that as the zone to measure within. So I draw a bunch of X's and extend the centers, you know, the X's where they intersect out towards the vanishing point to skewer the chair off in the distance. And then I go back to my sketch layer, use a black color and flesh out the lines for both chairs and so now I have the ribs that I was going for on both the bottom portion of the chair as well as the back support section of the chair and now I'm going to freehand some stuff that I notice on the center console that's below the chair a bit it's a really rough sketch going on down there it's not really something that I was super picky with or anything like that and then I go ahead and freehand the seat belt for the chair closest to us so at the page right side of the center console, I use the measurement layer and draw two purple diagonal lines going to the right. One line is closest to us on top of the center console, and the other line is furthest to us on the top of the center console. And then I join these lines using the vanishing point at the top and bottom. There's air conditioning controls here, so I go ahead and freehand a diagonal line then activate snapping to the perspective grid and extend a line towards the vanishing point and this new diagonal line and that region will be the air conditioning controls. I then use a dark blue color and draw a line going right at the top of the purple lines that I just drew out and extend it closer to us and further from us using the vanishing point because that's why you use a vanishing point to draw things that are coming towards us and away from us. I find halfway on the purple stuff that I just barely drew out and freehand a diagonal going through the center there. And on the side closest to us, I draw out an imaginary bottom face closest to us that merges with the center. So basically, it's a square that's attached to that center, okay? This square right here that I'm highlighting is half of what I need, so I measure out an extension. And now with that extension, I know that both sides of what I'll draw above the purple stuff is going to be symmetrical to the purple stuff. I'm noticing that this right here is doing something within this region. It's not just flat, it's doing something like this. If we were to be looking at it from a top view, it'd be doing something like that, okay? So I need to make measurements on this new blue face that I just created in order to keep it symmetrical while drawing out that sort of activity going on there. I use yellow and make a measurement, and then I use purple to make another measurement to the left of that. I then go to the sketch layer and flesh this out a little bit. So I made this measurement right here, and this tells me that this line goes here, and and this line goes here. I'm checking my reference from time to time to see what's going on. I go to my measurement layer and I draw this out from the vanishing point. And that's basically this line right here on my reference. So I do the same thing on the other line that's black. So there's this little bit of overlap in my image that doesn't exist inside of the reference image, and that's fine because I kind of eyeballed where the placement of my vanishing point and my horizon line would be. And so the camera angle in my image is slightly different than in my reference image. So now I use purple to continue those purple diagonal lines that I drew out earlier. And it does that a little bit even on the top face where it kind of extrudes right there, just a bit. So I draw a perspective line to represent the corner of the top top face of the dashboard. I basically drew this line right here on my reference right here. See? So that's basically what I just did. Okay, so it looks like that in this space right here and this space right here, we have two air conditioning vents. And it looks like we have a vent really close to us coming off the canvas. So I'm going to be working on that. I draw a diagonal at the bottom of the dashboard and use the vanishing point down there and extend it towards us 
and the dashboard is going to be around here. So now I'm going to pull out my sketch layer and flesh this stuff out a bit. And remember, for this particular composition, I am activating the snapping operation to my special guides, meaning my perspective grid, quite frequently. I'm activating it, deactivating it, depends on what I'm doing. For this particular composition, I felt like I needed to do this. I felt like it was the most productive thing that I could possibly do. So that's why I did it that way. So the purple stuff on the dashboard coming from the center console, it curves a bit, but it still retains that weird symmetrical extrusion that we established earlier. So with the sketch layer, I go ahead and make sure that things are wrapping around that symmetrical extrusion just right. Okay, so where the speedometer is on the reference, there's this dome shape. So I go ahead and just freehand a dome. Dome. Now, I've already taught how to draw ellipses to help you draw out that dome, and if you need to formally draw out an ellipse to get it to feel right, go ahead and just try and figure that out, how to do that, or you could go ahead and freehand it like I did, but f just generally for me, I went ahead and just freehanded it. Sometimes you just get the feel for how something is going to be and how it should look, and sometimes it just looks right for the composition, and so that's just generally what I did. And then I go ahead and finish off the page right furthest to the front of the dashboard, with a line coming from the vanishing point. And there's this little divot in the reference on the top face of the dashboard, where people sometimes keep junk paperwork and just generally things like that. And so I go ahead and draw something out for that. I use the perspective grid for that, but I also freehand the rounded edges for it too. Earlier in the purple stuff coming off the center console, I drew out a line of center. So I'm going to use that line of center that I drew out earlier and I'm going to freehand it, wrapping up and around the dashboard, coming in towards the windshield. I'm thinking in three dimensions. Things are 3D. Some things are flat and some things are round. I'm thinking all of this while I'm wrapping the center around all of that. And I follow that line through all of that experience that I've drawn out. And I follow it all the way to the curvature of the windshield, or at least where the windshield will be. And that's where I go ahead and draw where the rear view mirror goes. And I use the perspective grid to quickly sketch something out for that rear view mirror right there. Something quick, something easy. I then start fleshing out the windshield by using the vanishing point where I think the top of the windshield would be and freehand how I think the corner of it meets with the dashboard. I freehand most of the driver's side window, but the line at the bottom of it, I go ahead and snap my brush to the perspective grid and draw out that line. And then I start contemplating how the steering wheel will go. So I freehand a front face that's not a true square and use the vanishing point to pull some lines out away from us. And this gives me the ability to draw the left face of what I just drew out there. I look at my reference a bit and decide to draw a bit of a thick line to tell myself that the blinker will be right here and that when I pull out my sketch layer, uh, I need to flesh that out a little bit better. I don't need to concern myself too much with that with the measurements layer. I kind of experiment with how the steering wheel will be attached to all of this. Now, you can treat everything as if it's like 3D modeling with perspective, or you can just do things a little bit organically from time to time to figure things out in difficult areas. Sometimes it's either or. Sometimes it's more helpful to be really strict to the geometry, and sometimes it really helps to just do things organically. For me personally, for this composition, I decided to go with something that's a little bit more organic. So I just freehanded a diagonal front face in the center of this weird boxy shape that I just barely drew out, and I use purple in order to start drawing out the steering wheel. That front face that I drew out before using the purple, that winds up being the center of the steering wheel. I then start drawing out an extension from one square to the other, just to make sure that they're symmetrical on both sides, that they're the same measurement, both squares on either side of that center, okay? And I'm pleasantly surprised that either square on either side of this center matches up rather well. And so I just go ahead and use yellow to freehand the steering wheel's ellipse and kind of flesh it out a little bit. So now I go back to my sketch layer and solidify things a little bit so that things are less theoretical. The measurement layer is for theory and measuring, and the sketch layer really makes things come together quite a bit. And so now I'm just fleshing out the steering wheel, the blinker, the windshield, and the rear view mirror. And so now I believe I'm working on the vent that's closest to the camera here. 
So I go ahead and pull out the measurements layer and draw out a little bit of a rectangle and uh, draw out a bunch of X's that are equal measurements and such like that and pull some lines from the vanishing point. And now it's time to flesh things out with the sketch layer. I start by creating a bit of a border around the vent and at the true center of the vent I draw out a little bit of a square and then draw some little jitters that look like the edges of, you know, blinds to a window and flesh out those perspective lines that I measured out and that pretty much finishes off that vent and I use this line and this line in order to draw out this thing right here on my reference so I pull out my sketch layer and tinker with that a little bit so now back to my measurements layer I use red and make measurements and since everything here is diagonal in relationship to the vanishing point after finding a new measurement I freehand the, the measurement that the centers that I wind up finding and then I wrap these measurements around the front using the vanishing point, and then I freehand them wrapping around to the other vent. And I use the lines around that area to guide me on how I should wrap those red lines around there. I go back to my sketch layer and sketch out a border around these and then repeat the exact same process as I did with the previous vent. I go ahead and move the reference image and move it to the top of the stacking order on my layers panel. Uh, the next step is the headrest of the chairs. And so I go ahead and draw out the front face of one of the headrests uh, using a dark blue I extend the bottom and top corners of this shape off towards the other seat and I switch back to the red color and flesh out the back corner of this headrest. And then I do the same thing with the headrest on the other chair. But some of the work has already been done because we have these blue lines that are extending out towards the vanishing point. And it tells us how things should proportionally come together, one headrest to the other as it extends off towards the distance. Then I go to my sketch layer to make this stuff look pretty. On this headrest that's closest to us, there's a little bit of overlap with some of the stuff that I drew out earlier. So I go ahead and just erase that overlap and flesh out the headrest a little bit more. So now I go ahead and zoom in where the stereo should be, and I draw out where the screen should be for it, where it displays what radio station you're listening to, and I also draw the bottom of the stereo as well with just one line using the vanishing point. There's two knobs to the radio, so I draw out an ellipse and then another ellipse right next to it, and that's basically my cylinder right there that represents the knobs. Uh, since these ellipses are so small, it's okay to freehand these, I feel. Then there's the preset buttons under the stereo, so I just go ahead and use the measurement layer and kind of sketch it out in green first. And then I go to my sketch layer and flesh that out a little bit more to be a, a lot more official. On the reference, the radio looks a bit more complex than what I actually drew out. It just, it looks different, but I really don't care. I, so I decide that I want to have this little storage area under my radio uh, for maybe where people might keep things like uh, flash drives, envelopes, or whatever weird crap people tend to keep in their cars. And then I go to where the air conditioner controls are going to be. I kind of set that up earlier, and I kind of flesh out this area with a series of ellipses. Notice that I use the measurement layer to signify the tops and the bottoms of where these ellipses should be. It's only just a few pixels there, so trying to to do really super official measurements to get really super official ellipses uh, and, and getting that just perfect it just it doesn't make any sense it's probably going to be more confusing than anything so freehanding it is probably the best route so now we need to make the transmission setup right here uh, the gear shifter thingamajig uh, so I just freehand how I think that should go and I get rid of the overlap so that things don't look like they're transparent and this whole time, even though I'm freehanding this, I'm still thinking in terms of perspective. I'm still thinking in terms of front face, left face, right face, top face. I'm still thinking like that. Even though I'm not drawing everything out perfectly in relationship to the vanishing point, I'm still thinking like this. Most things are fairly 
perfect in relationship to the vanishing point, but since you happen to be using a vanishing point, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to suck out your soul. Then I continue to use the sketch layer to flesh out the driver's side window, and to flesh out the rear driver's side window as well. I then kind of sketch out some oh crap handles, and I just freehand this stuff. Like, I'm not really using a vanishing point. I could have created a whole new perspective grid or, or perspective guides for the oh crap handles, but I'm somewhat sure that most people that have been following along with this video are probably really confused about this whole process. So I might as well try to keep things as simple as possible for right now. Again, I'm still thinking in terms of perspective, but I don't need to go crazy with everything. Again, perspective doesn't necessarily have to suck out your soul. As you keep drawing in perspective and keep practicing, Eventually you'll get a handle on when you can get away with just freehanding things, when you can and when you can't get away with it. I mean, how often are people going to be looking at the oh crap handles uh, because they're, they're just really not the point of focus in the illustration. Okay, so when I took a look at the reference image, I can see that I definitely have a different vantage point towards the back seat than what I do inside of my reference. So it's going to look a little bit different than my reference. We did establish earlier the camera angle is slightly different in my picture than my reference image okay this is this is fine so I go ahead and draw out some faces for the back support and the bottom of the back seat to the car and with my measurement layer I'm treating everything as if the front seats and the center console all of that I'm, I'm basically fleshing out the back seat as if the front seats and the center console are transparent I'm really not all too careful with the back seat to be honest uh, don't get me wrong I make sure that it looks correct enough that it doesn't look like an eyesore. But although I do make some measurements for the ribs, I generally I really don't go nuts in making sure that it's absolutely perfect. I then pull out my sketch layer and flesh out the purple lines that I've laid out on the measurement layer. Most of my tender loving care for these back seats comes in the form of the sketch layer and the inking layer. There isn't an inking layer on my layers panel yet, but there will be. Once I have the back seats sketched out, I can go back to my measurements layer and flesh out the ribbed section just like I did with the driver's side and passenger side seats. Eventually while doing that, I wound up getting distracted by the perspective grid layer that I've had on the screen this whole time, so at this point I just shut it off and continue with my measurements. Then I pull out my sketch layer and flesh out the ribs. And then I flesh out the rear view mirror using the vanishing point for the top of it and then freehand the rest. With the sketch layer, I look at at my reference to flesh out the driver's side door just a touch and now it's time to ink this sucker all of the hard work has been done and all that's left with the inking process is to get the existing lines with the sketch layer and improve upon them I still use the perspective guide or perspective grid quite frequently throughout the whole process inking this thing now I lower the opacity on the sketch layer so that it's rather dim and I go to the layer menu up at the top and then go correction layer and go gradient map and I press OK on the pop-up menu that appears and then I right click on the gradient map layer on the layers panel and click on clip it to the layer below then I double click on the gradient map to bring up that pop-up window that appeared just previously and I, I just have it on the screen again and I change the darkest color to the left uh, to a red and then I press OK I then press Control E on this in order to merge it with with the sketch layer so that all of my line work on my sketch layer is now permanently red. I then create a vector layer and move it to the top of the stacking order. On the measurements layer you can see that there's this square icon on here. This means that it is the layer that has the perspective guides on it. Well, I want those same perspective guides on my vector layer. And so I press Alt on my keyboard and click and drag on it and put it onto my vector layer. And that basically duplicates the perspective grid onto my vector layer. And then I rename the vector layer to inks. And then I start inking. From here on out, there's not really too much to really say that's all too technical and all too helpful. All the information 
information is on the canvas, all that's left is to just make it all look better. So I guess I'll take a little bit of time to kind of talk about my impressions of how Clip Studio Paint handles vector layers and my impressions of the workflow and kind of discuss whatever else is on my mind as well. I do find it a little bit weird that uh, vector layers and such like that, uh, vectors in general instead of Clip Studio Paint, uh, they don't look like vectors. They, you know, as you zoom in and closer and closer to the canvas, uh, they still remain very pixelated and such like that. And I think the main reason for that is because uh, Clip Studio Paint is geared towards uh, being for comic books and such like that. And so maybe seeing how everything looks uh, at least uh, pixelated and such like that and for print and all that. Maybe that is in general the, what they're going for with the vectors in that regard. And uh, one thing that I noticed was really convenient was how when I draw with the, the vectors instead of Clip Studio Paint, it's not like how it is in Adobe Illustrator or in Affinity Designer or anything like that. It is super smooth. It, it behaves just exactly the same as how I, it would if I was working with uh, rasters and such like that. And that is something that's completely foreign to me. And I think maybe the reason for that is because, you know, resource allocation, maybe uh, it's just less difficult for the hardware to process vectors as if they were raster. Uh, and so maybe that's the reason why the drawing experience or the inking experience with vectors is so pleasant. Uh, I think that's just awesome. Now, I didn't necessarily need to use a vector layer, but I just thought that I should. Uh, but if I happen to need to modify a line at all with the vector layers, uh, it doesn't behave like how it does instead of uh, any other program that has vectors. Typically, uh, I'm able to control control points and uh, handles and such like that, but there are no handles and, uh, you know, this hovering technique over uh, strokes in order to access the, uh, you know, the control points that are on that specific line or stroke or what have you. Uh, that is something that I don't know if I'll ever get used to, primarily because uh, a lot of the time you know, when you're inking and such, there's going to be overlap, even just a little bit of overlap between one line to another. And so you're going to wind up having these little instances where you are basically accidentally switching between these two lines and you accidentally click on the wrong control point. Uh, that's something that I thought was really weird. Uh, also, trying to make lines thicker and thinner, that was a a little weird. Sometimes I w I'd wind up making lines uh, thicker and thinner, like multiple lines uh, thicker and thinner rather than just one. And it's not as controllable as in Affinity Designer, which is a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, also, you know, the way that you modify uh, control points, like look at, remember what you just saw on the screen right there on the, on the actual, uh, you know, steering wheel. Uh, I used a proper ellipse in order to make the steering wheel with the inking layer. And uh, the utility tool is what you use in order to work with both special guides, you know, your grid or whatever it is, uh, your, your perspective grid or whatever it is, uh, and also with vectors. And this seems like an oversight because if I have an ellipse underneath uh, a vector uh, line, uh, Unless, yeah, unless I, I, I have an opening in that ellipse somewhere, uh, there's no way to access the special guide, which in this case was the ellipse. And so I had to actually grab one of the control points and wonk it out of shape, and then grab the guide and delete it, and then uh, go ahead and just delete that control point that I've wonked out of shape, because it's... Uh, it's highly unlikely that I'd be able to get it perfectly in the right spot and such like that. Uh, so that that's a little bit of frustration that I experienced with the, the you know the whole inking process with vectors. But by and large, it it is a, a pleasant experience most of the time. It's a pleasant experience at least. And uh, so yeah, you know, 
Uh, some people may look at this video and say, hey, look, it's almost an hour. You should have split this up to being something like three or four different videos. But every time I do that, the first video gets a whole lot of love and none of the other videos ever get watched. And it's to me, it just seems like it, it would be more convenient to have everything in one nice, neat package. The only thing is that it puts a little bit extra stress on me to make sure that it's edited by the end of the week. And that stress made it so that the end product of this uh, image is not colored. It's just inked and such like that. So, you know, forgive me for, you know, just trying to make it without necessarily uh, having uh, all the bells and whistles, the coloring and all that. Uh, but yeah. I am somewhat thinking of adding a character into this image and telling a story with it. Uh, something that I relate to personally where uh, basically it's a character just tr hoping that the car starts. Uh, I, I think a lot of us can relate with that. So anyways, the final image is coming up on the screen right now. And you know, everything is just super smooth. Everything is just, just right, I feel. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with it, and I'm, I'm actually really happy with Clip Studio Paint as well. Um, you, you know, there are some quirks to it that I, I don't necessarily think are very good, but most of it is a pleasant experience. So, anyhow. Anyways, guys, that pretty much concludes it for this video. If you guys enjoyed it, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And if you guys would like to have more participation with my community, feel free to join my Discord server. A link is in the video description below. And if you guys would like to support this channel, there's an image of my mascot in the upper right corner of the screen. It leads to my Patreon. Any support would be much appreciated. And if you've enjoyed this content and would like to see more, feel free to click on anything else that's appearing on the screen right now. Thank you very much for your time.